welcome to TFYLP, Transformers for Your Listening Pleasure, episode number 262. I am Deron Land, a.k.a. Weird Wolf. Uh, along with me this evening is a special guest, uh, Mr. Benson Yee from BWTF.com, uh, Ben's World of Transformers. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to have you on again. Um, we're trying a little bit of uh, a different format tonight. Um as many of you know that as this broadcast airs, uh, TFCon USA in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. is uh, in full swing. Uh, that's where Megamus is, and I know Headmaster Dawn's there, and uh, uh, Nats May. Uh, several other members, Daniel, uh, are in attendance at the convention. Plus, it's, it's just that time of year uh, whenever a lot of people are traveling, a lot of people have things going on it's really difficult to get a podcast going and uh, so that's why for the last several weeks we've had some issues i've put up some old episodes kind of kind of spliced them up and uh and uh presented them in a new fresh way i hope you guys are enjoying those classic episodes of tfylp it's it's kind of kind of a good uh uh look back on where uh, we've been not just as a podcast, but as a collector community, uh, talking about things. Uh, I, 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 for one, got a kick out of listening to the Fall of Cybertron uh, game discussion that we did several years ago whenever it first came out. Uh, some things that I'd actually forgot about. Uh, uh, have you had a chance to check it out, Benson? I haven't, but uh, I just, just the mention of Fall of Cybertron, I go back to my memories of that time and how excited we were over so many of the things that were coming out at that point. Uh, that was an interesting turning point for generations. And I think if we back then told our current selves what we have, we wouldn't believe ourselves. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I mean, Fall of Cybertron was, in my opinion, such uh, leaps and bounds above uh, previous Transformer games that we had gotten. And uh, even today, there's still a lot of people talking about it, still a lot of people uh, that are fans of the aesthetic uh, of the of the character designs and everything. Uh, there, even there's third, third parties that are, that are making, uh, still making Fall of Cybertron aesthetic toys years after the, the game is, you know, come and gone, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just the mere fact that it's got that holding power, it's it's really it's really good to go back and and say, hey, that was a turning point for this franchise. I mean, like you said, the Generations line uh, really took off um, after that. Uh, I mean, it was it was great for that. I mean, you know, we had the classics and stuff, uh, but after that, I mean. Who knew we would have got the wreckers and, and, and as a ruination? <laughs> you know that. Uh, that was that was really really cool, uh, but uh, before we go into our topic tonight, um, we've got Benson on here to talk about his experiences at the uh, Hascon event. Uh, you were a VIP attendee, is that correct? Correct. Uh, uh, VIP. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Uh, just so the audience understands the difference, uh, there were several ticket tiers uh, at Hascon. You had a very basic ticket tier, uh, which you could just buy one day and uh, you know just go in and you could attend panels and so on. But there were certain things that you were restricted from. Uh, if you paid for the VIP package, uh, which was about $600, uh, that allowed you into several uh, panels and events that uh, other Transformers fans who only paid the daily package wouldn't have been able to get into. Yeah, that's uh, and, and we'll, we'll we'll go into that uh, here briefly. Uh, but before but before I'll get my words out here. <laughs> but before we go into that, uh, I want to mention our sponsors: uh, CapturePrey.com, great toys, great prices, great service. CapturePrey.com, where you can save even more uh, with free domestic shipping on orders of one hundred fifty dollars or more. Uh, as well as if you're an international purchaser, uh, you'll get discounted shipping on. Uh, orders of $150 or more. CapturePrey.com, great toys, great prices, great service. Uh, as well as Mega Toy Fan. Mega Toy Fan, you can find Mega Toy Fan at the popular robot and toy conventions year round, such as TFCon, 
uh, Pete's Robot Convention, uh, lo uh, lots of uh, great shows year-round that you can find Mega Toy Fan at. Maximize your collection while minimizing your cost with MegatoyFan.com. And if you're not attending shows, uh, feel free to find him on Facebook. He's easily located that way. Uh, just search for Megamus or Mega Toy Fan, and you'll find uh, some great deals that way. Also, Ripped Apparel. If you are sh shopping at Ripped Apparel and find some great uh, Transformers related mashup uh, t-shirts there or even if you just get something that's not Transformers related uh, from there on checkout be sure to use the promo code TFYLPPOD and you will save 10% on your order at RippedApparel.com uh, so without further ado uh, Benson um, what what were your thoughts going into uh, Has, uh, the Hascon event now we've we've talked about this show several times uh previously on tfylp um and uh, admittedly it's not entirely been positive because it first the price was was really up there uh but there were so many faux pas it seemed like hasbro was doing uh what were your thoughts on that was it positive negative um uh my initial thought, once I realized that they were going for a multi-brand convention and not just a replacement for BotCon, uh, was that I had to take a lot of my preconceived notions as a longtime BotCon attendee and you know uh, a fan and and kind of push them aside. There's no way you could just throw them out the window, but I had to try to shove them aside as much as possible because the moment you need to blend My Little Pony and Magic and Dungeons and Dragons and everything with Transformers it's not botcon anymore right yeah. so uh, that's the first thing i had to it's not a transformer specific event yeah correct and what was difficult about that is i i'm sure like yourself you know you've attended other conventions comic cons you know uh, i grew up going to creation star trek conventions oh, um you know I'd things like to. that yeah right? <laughs> that takes you back yeah. uh, <laughs> i'd love to have went to one that's my thing yeah <laughs> Uh, I'm a huge I Star mean, Trek fan, so it, the glory days, you know, like mm -hmm. when you used to pay 25 bucks to get in, and that included like the autograph and the all the panels and all that stuff. So uh, my experience with conventions goes way back, and I realized that this was a different animal, right? And as the months went along, and they started posting updates on their website as to who the guests were going to be, um, who, uh, what events they were going to be, I started understanding that more and more this really wasn't botcon this was it, it felt like it was distancing itself as much as possible from botcon and i was a little sad about that um but i also understood the necessity of it you know i try to balance my understanding of what hasbro was trying to accomplish in turning themselves into not just a toy company but an entertainment company with what we fans can get out of that and there's no doubt that Transformers as a brand has benefited from that over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, that said, once they started posting more information, like the ticket prices, like yourself, I got a little bit of sticker shock. Because if you compare their prices, and I say this in my review, so there's nothing you know new here. Mm -hmm. um, their ticket prices are equivalent to a Comic-Con. But they're not Comic-Con. So you know, uh, uh, that's not to bash the event. That's not to say it was a bad event, but the scale of a comic con is such that you could attend all four days of a comic con and not see it all. Oh gosh. If you're lucky, you've seen 60% of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's just no conceivable way you could attend everything that you want to attend to at a, at a comic con, uh, or even close to 75% just, and the sheer spectacle of it, of a comic con is insane. Um, in contrast, they're asking the same price and they did deliver a spectacle. I'm not going to say they didn't. They absolutely did, especially the Transformers team. And we'll talk more about that later. But at the same time, it's still not Comic-Con. It's still not that scale. But yeah. that's the money you're asking. And then when you looked at the VIP, which was 600, right? Then I realized, oh, but wait, there's two Transformers VIP events, which you have to add on each for 200. Oh. But then yeah. they consolidated them into one that was still 200. Then that got folded into the VIP. Now, that's Transformers. But with Pony and Joe, my understanding is you still had to pay separate. So it, 
you know, you start seeing that, and just from an organizational standpoint, from a customer standpoint, you start going, guys, what's what's going on here? It's like they weren't on, they weren't entirely on the same page with their with themselves. Mm-hmm. And then, as you know, not too long before the con, out came the Groupon and the backflip mm-hmm. code, which took two hundred fifty dollars off the VIP. And at that point, I had already paid, and so had a lot of other people. And I saw a lot of outrage over that, you know. Hey, Rightfully so. Yeah, exactly. And I can't blame them because I was one of them. I had paid the $600. I had written to them and said, look, you just got this code. You know, I just bought it two weeks ago. Like, can, can you do something for me here? Not, not even necessarily, you know, giving me my money back. I get no refunds. I yeah. understand that. But can I get credit at the Hasbro store? Can I get funds to credit towards next year's show you know something right yeah. so some recognition that hey you're a vip we're going to take care of you mm-hmm. and i was flatly denied several times now what compounded my trepidation um is that weeks prior to buying the vip pass i had actually been granted a press badge and i, I was very happy about that but then I asked, well, okay, I still, you know, I want to provide coverage of the, um, the, the dinner, you know, uh, the special panels and so on. You know, can I be provided that type of access? You would think that you would be able to. Yeah. And now at a Comic-Con, I wouldn't, right? Because it's such a gigantic monster of a show. Mm-hmm. But this is their inaugural show. I figured you guys want as much coverage as possible, as much positivity as possible for the press. Uh, and I thought they would let me add it on. Mind you. I wasn't asking for a free ride. I was asking, can I just buy the dinner event and add it on to my press badge? But there was no way to do that. So I was flatly denied. That's why I had to buy the VIP badge. Um, and unfortunately, you know, between that, the, the lack of, you know, wanting to help me out or give me some type of credit back, uh, all that, it really filled me with a lot of trepidation. As mm-hmm. a, I mean, I got to tell you, even as I was taking the train up there to Rhode Island, I felt like it at that point, it felt more like a work trip mm-hmm. than how I would feel when I was going to BotCon. Uh, the other part of the problem, and I think you might have experienced this, you know, when you folks were chatting about it previously, a lot of my friends who I would normally see at BotCon got totally priced out. Like they just couldn't either afford it or they, from what was being shown on the website, they didn't feel it was worth the money that was being asked. Yeah. So I didn't even have that anticipation of, oh, I'm going to see so-and-so and and such and such at the show and we're going to go out and we're going to get drinks or whatever. You know, yes, a few of my friends were there, mostly guys who were also covering the convention, but it wasn't like a BotCon where 20, 30 people that I know were all going to be there and we're all going to go get beers or something like that. So it lost a lot of that. I I can probably count on both my hands how many people I know that actually went there. Mm. Uh, And that, and that was what was scary. Uh, You know, I not, I've said before, I myself that even if I, I wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't available to go. I didn't have the time available uh, to get off from work. Uh, But, even had I had that time, uh, there's no way I could have afforded that. I mean, mm. I live, mm-hmm. you know, you know, a day away, so I would either have to fly or take an extra day, two days to drive to and from, you know, um, and uh, lodging and food and you know, if I wanted to buy anything at the event, plus the event, there there was just no way I could have afforded it. Mm-hmm. I mean, BotCon is is one thing. But whenever you start tacking on several hundred dollars uh, for an event, and couple it with the fact that I'm 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 a Transformers fan only. I, I, I'm marginally a GI Joe fan. I you know I watched the show as a kid. Uh, I liked some of the characters. I had some of the toys, but it didn't capture me like Transformers does. Mm-hmm. Uh, I care nothing about magic. I care nothing about any of those other properties. I mean, it's it'd be one of those things where I'm like that's cool. Okay, it doesn't yeah. transform. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. So the the event itself just really really didn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. So you know, just the even even considering spending that kind of money to go 
wasn't even an option because it just didn't uh, come across as appealing. It's it's like going to a restaurant and you have the option to get the most expensive menu uh, item on the menu, but it, it 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 doesn't appeal to you, so you just don't mm-hmm. want it. Um, but you know, going up to the convention and uh, as many listeners uh, to the show uh, can attest, uh, you know, we t- we talked about it and I wanted to present a it in a in a positive light because you know this is hasbro this is a brand that that or this is a the, these are the people that puts out the brand that we love so much this is why we're here uh as a podcast you know you know i don't want to sit here and bash it but there was just so much fodder to bash well and you especially know. we're ta- we're still in the part leading up to it right yeah. like i haven't act- arrived yet now yeah. The, the good thing, you know, spoiler alert, everyone, uh, the good thing about it is once I got there, there's a lot to love. And I, I'll get into that once we get to that section. There, But, you know, in terms of the pregame, <laughs> it, it wasn't a very strong showing in the pregame. Yeah. And um, I, I, I get what you're saying. And I, when my friend said, well, I'm not going, I, honestly, I didn't try to really convince anyone because, look, I, 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 I have one friend who's a father, you know, of two. And he, you know, because his daughters would have loved Pony and, and, you know, some of the Disney princess brands, he would have loved to bring them. He was actually in, I would argue, more of the target audience for this event than I was. Uh, Here I am, solo Transformers guy. He is Transformers guy with an interest in Marvel and Star Wars. His daughters want Pony and Disney princesses. Like, they are the family that really should have gone. But when he did the math, he gamed it out with me one day. He just said, I'm blowing $5,000 before I even walk through the door. You know, I, between travel, lodging, yeah. VIP tickets, getting the kids in, the My Little Pony event. I mean, five grand. How do you ask someone to commit what is essentially a down payment on a car? <laughs> you or, know? Uh, well, that's uh, actually the price of my pickup. I drive. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it, it's tough. And, and unfortunately, you know, afterwards, a lot of the reports were, yeah, the Transformers events were cool. The Transformers event uh, area, exhibition area was awesome. Uh, the Pony people were in hog heaven. I mean, yeah, that's great. We know that after the fact, but before there was just no way to tell that from what was being advertised on, um, on the website. So, you know, and plus, uh, you know, when he told me, Oh, it's like five grand. I said, well, I, I can't tell you to spend that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's but like I, trying to sell ice to the Eskimos as, as the old yeah. adage goes, you know, you know, it's not something I need. Yeah. You know? Well, let me ask you, you know, if the prices had been from the beginning what they were when the Groupons came out, because the Groupon and the backflip code basically sliced about a third off the prices of mm-hmm. all the tickets and everything, would, would that have made it easier for you? Possibly, but there's still the the hurdle of the big question of is there going to be enough Transformers content there for mm-hmm. me to justify going? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, knowing that it's a mixed event, mixed uh, franchise event, um, you know, I didn't know if if going to the show would have been worth it, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for me because uh, you know, and and looking at the pictures, you know, I've I've looked through your pictures and several of my friends that have went. Um, a lot of the things I'm like, eh, I saw that at BotCon in 2011. <laughs> I saw that one at BotCon in 2012. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. You know, like the, like the big prime statue. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I believe that was, you know, that was uh, at one 20, of the BotCons, yeah. 2015. I think it, uh, it, it nearly collapsed on someone <laughs> after the show. Um, uh, or was that the Grimlock? I, can't, I know I know one of those big statues. I think it was the Grimlock. Yeah. I don't think it was that. That probably would have really hurt someone. If <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, it was you know they were taking it down and it nearly fell on someone. Mm-hmm. I remember, um, but you know, I just I, I just had the big question of I know it's not a botcon. I know there's not panels. There's no dealer room per, per se, which was my big draw, uh, mm-hmm. being able to look at new and old toys. You know, uh, you know, I, I, it, there's just that big question of is it even worth it? You know, for even at a quarter or half the price, you know, it's not a botcon, and, and we've said that so many times. It's not botcon. It's not a Transformers convention. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
do you know, I, I question whether or not that even next year, you know, given what I've seen, I, I, is, is it would it be worth me going? I mean, I might try if I can afford it, right? Just to experience it. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me. Um, why don't we get into the show itself? Okay. Um, okay. Like, you know, now Ben's arrived, and um, let me. Let, let's do this. Let, let's be positive because I, I, I appreciate that about what you said before, and I want to be positive because I, I love the guys at Hasbro. Hasbro has always been very kind to me. Um, I think they have made great strides in the last decade reaching out to fans, working with websites and so on. So I want to give them credit where they deserve it. So the first thing I'm going to say that they absolutely nailed, like hands down, no question, did it right, was anything that was for uh, their their brands aimed towards kids. So Pony, Play-Doh, For Real Friends, Disney Princesses, those brands absolutely nailed everything they had these amazing play areas set up for kids uh, like one of my favorites a play-doh area they had a little quote-unquote play-doh kitchen set up and like a, i think roughly on an hourly basis they would have a c- cooking class you know i'm mm. doing air quotes here uh yeah. and the kids could sit there and use these little bowls and make their own play-doh food you know uh the for real friends it was a pit where kids could just basically frolic with fuzzy mechanical animals you know i mean this is good stuff yeah. The pony area was insane. I mean, you know, tons of photo ops, a, a hairstyling station, you know, they tack those ponytail things on. <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, look, if you're like six or seven years old and you're Been a little kid, you, you would just lose your mind. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, Saturday, when most of the kids were there, they were, uh, I did not see one unhappy kid. Every kid was engaged, excited, happy. And I will tell you, for the parents, I think, you know, when they get to wander over to kind of Star Wars and, and things that their pop culture experience has, you know, brought them up on, they were happy. Uh, but I also think from a parental point of view, I think a lot of them were probably very happy because their kids were probably exhausted afterwards. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they probably got a really good night's sleep that night. Well, that, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, <laughs> that we were talking about uh, whenever we were searching for positives, uh, talking about it leading up to it, uh, was that I gave Hasbro and, and still do give Hasbro uh, credit where it is due, uh, for trying to evolve the, uh, the convention experience for their brands. You know, this, you know, it's forward thinking what they're doing. Um, you know, and and in all reality, just their execution really was the only problem, in my mm-hmm, opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, you're not wrong. You, you're right, and we'll get into the, the the kind of pits, the pitfalls they kind of fell into later on. Um, but more on the positive. Let's now let's get yeah. to the transformer stuff, right? The, the, I know what you said before, and you're absolutely right. A lot of the components of what they showed us, we've seen before. Uh, the Prime statue, the Bumblebee car, you know, yes, we've seen those before. But, you know, n- not everyone there did, right? And a lot yeah. of those kids who, were, who are the fans of the future, th- to them it was amazing to see all that. And there were plenty of people, like walk-ins and stuff, who mm-hmm. were taking pictures with the Prime statue because they've never seen it before. So I'm really glad that from the, like, prop perspective they kind of brought out the big guns you know you had the optimus peter built sitting outside in the, oh, yeah. the area where you get food and you just hug out with optimus while you're eating your lunch you know that was great uh also I, i'm gonna give hasbro a lot of kudos for the way they laid out the transformers area first of all they had more real estate so you know you remember how it is at bakon like hey, everyone crowds into the oh, display yeah. case and we're all like elbowing each other there was very little of that because there was so much room to kind of maneuver thank mm-hmm. goodness um, but also, I like the way they broke up the area. Uh, it was almost a progression, right? You, 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 there was like a movie watching area, little video game area. But then once you started hitting the toys, it really went by age. It went by, you know, first you hit Rescue Bots, then you hit R.I.D., then you had Generations, and then you had like a little mini stage uh, where they had their own mini signings. And then the rest of the area was just glass cases full of stuff. Mm-hmm. And unlike... BotCon, where it's so focused on this is the stuff we're getting next year, or this is the stuff that's out in stores now. We had a couple glass cases dedicated towards here's a bunch of prototypes or grays of things that you had never seen before, which was amazing. And then right next to that, and this was this is fan service is 
um, here's our from the Hasbro archives. Here's our Action Master Prime and our Fort Max and whatever that we yanked out of our warehouse, you know, to display. And uh, I don't know if you saw the pictures, but against the wall they had like some of the original drawings, that like the spec drawings of the MicroMaster bases and stuff like that. I mean, this is the stuff us fanboys love. Uh, that would be under the archive display. Uh, uh, yes, right, archive I'm, display. Let me see if yeah. I can screen share this here. Oh um, uh, yeah, I've got it pulled up here. Uh, you won't be able to see it, but the viewers will. All right, <laughs> All so let the viewers, I'll talk through All right. it as, the um, as we go through Okay, it. I've got the uh, the space case pulled up here. Yep, um, so something that was painted up that we never got to see release, and there it is right in front of us. Uh, now, what was this? Was this the Teradive, the, the Teradive mold? Correct, uh, painted up as G2 space case. I would have been all over that. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> First of all, it's a fun toy to begin with. Yeah. Uh, and second of all, the color scheme. Come on, it just works. Well, the ter the the space case that we got was more of a clear and everything. It yes. didn't have the telltale grid pattern that it was painted mm -hmm. on. That was that mm -hmm. was amazing. Uh, <laughs> next, we've got a star scream. Yep. Uh, it looks like. Yep. Uh, I can't see the picture. Is that the sky warp? Uh, okay, <laughs> maybe it is. It's it, it is purple and black. So yeah. So unreleased movie deluxe Skywarp, which uh, you know I would have bought to complete my little trio. Mm -hmm. Let's see here, a red B, uh, yeah, BMW. Uh, the Mercedes. Oh, the, the Mercedes. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, just, see, I saw the logo on the front. <laughs> that one's my favorite because it's so out of left field. First of all, that deluxe Soundwave sculpt apparently will never come out in the U.S. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Everyone wanted it, yeah. right? But it, it never occurred to me to turn that into a blaster, and that's what you're looking at. Oh, that – oh, wow. Look at the head okay. and look at the colors. It's, oh. it's a reddish gold hue to it, and the head is actually a re-sculpt uh, with the visor eyes. Why do why, – they even made a prototype of a toy mm -hmm. that never even got released. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> But wow. I love seeing stuff like this. You know, maybe maybe some of the younger fans won't care until they're a little older. But for guys like us, mm -hmm. this is the stuff that kills. And it was there. And I give them a lot of props for that. Yeah, that that is awesome. All right, now we've got, uh, looks like some Titan Returns uh, protos. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the great protos for uh, Octane and uh, Top Spin. Looks like Twin Twist. I uh, can't tell who's that at the bottom there. Uh, yeah, some of them are a little hard to see. Unfortunately, the lighting was a little weird. But what you know, what's great about it is we got to see some unreleased stuff, but we also got to see some <clears> great <throat> stuff we do have on shelf. And how often do we get to see that? Really, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a the other case where there was a they had a Fort Max and a Metroplex. I think gray one next to the other, so you could kind of understand that one came from the other. Uh, but that that section alone was unexpected, and I'm, I'm going to kind of critique but compliment simultaneously is this was an awesome idea, having the archive, having that display there. I wish they had mentioned it on their material on the website beforehand. It would have been a big draw, yeah. Yeah, because they have a Transformers experience listed, but they don't define what that experience is. And if you had told me six months ago, we're going to have G1 from the archives of Hasbro on display. We're going to have gray models. We're going to have unreleased prototypes. We're going to have movie props all over the place. You know, If they had given us that idea of the, the scope of this, I think more people would have been excited. Well, and I think that's one of the biggest uh, critiques that we had prior to the show was the fact that they were so tight-lipped on what they were offering. You know, what was what was there to entice people to go to the show when you didn't know what 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 you were spending your money on? I mean, you don't want to spend money sight unseen on sure. something. You know, and that, that was one of our biggest critiques for BotCon. Uh, was that they waited so long to tell us what the exclusives were? Uh, you know, it's like we want to know, so we uh, we want to know ahead of time that way, so we know to to that we actually want these toys. You know, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say though, there's something weird going on in I think the convention industry as a whole, uh, based on what you just said, mm -hmm. because I've been to a couple conventions lately where 
you know, a certain guest won't get announced till like two to three weeks before the convention's going to happen, or you know, a certain event or activity won't be announced. So that not just Hascon, but other conventions yeah. I've been to, and, and you would think, gosh, you know, guys, if you had announced this four months ago, I would have bought the ticket right there and then but you know that could be they couldn't book the person or the person didn't sign the contract until you know there's all these behind the scenes shenanigans i know that are going on that prevent them from doing that what i'm hoping is that they learn from this experience they understand that people really dug what they did and then next year they say you know what this is what we're going to have bullet point you know archives bullet point play area and just really lay it out there because they know it works they know people like it the kids and the adults loved it um, and it's one of the things I praise in my review, and I'm sure others have. So hopefully they take this as a learning going forward, and next year they'll say, this is what you get, boom, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's one of those things, and this goes not just for Hascom, but, I mean, any convention, uh, like you said, if you if you give some selling points early on, I mean, you don't have to, you know, as, as, as a the saying goes, blow your whole wad on, you know, and say what you're going to do mm-hmm. beforehand, but just at least give enticing tidbits of, okay, we're going to have this, we're going to have this, we're going to have this, and then say, and more, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, give, put some stuff out there that, uh, you know, don't be ambiguous about it. Don't just say, for example, like Hasbro, Hascon said, uh, this is going to be a, uh, a Transformers experience. Okay, well, can you tell me a little bit about what mm-hmm. the Transformers experience is? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and and that that was one of the things. Uh, you know, they were they posted a a video on the official Transformers Facebook page uh, that was really high. Uh, they were trying to really hype up the event for mm-hmm. the Transformers, and. A lot of people were coming on there and bashing it, but I typed out this big long paragraph. You know, I hope they read it. You know, I was trying to be respectfully critical. You know, uh-huh. uh, you know, not not in. A, I'm just coming on here just to bitch, as it were. Uh, uh-huh. But I wanted them to know, hey, let us know something. You know, don't just uh-huh. come on and hype up. What? You know, what are you hyping? You know. They uh, they need they need to learn that, and I, I hope that this experience uh, taught them something. Other oh here's yeah, the I, uh, the scorn as I'm scrolling through the picture. I'm, yeah, I'm uh, going to give them benefit of the doubt and say that part of the reason they didn't post a lot of stuff, oh, not that this is good, but part of the reason is contracts stuff they didn't have 100 percent cemented and it's worse if you say okay we're going to have bumblebee there and then bumblebee's not there right yeah. um i'm guessing that's the case uh just again give them benefit of the doubt but now that they've pulled one off and they've in this respect have pulled it off very successfully i hope next year they they solidify things like i hope right now for the next hascod they're already saying okay we're gonna need bumblebee there we're gonna need a prime there we're gonna need a big statue you know we're gonna need the archives taken out and you know certain things they have more control over others the cars i don't think they own so obviously they no. had to work with someone right yeah but you know what displaying the old g1 toys that's all them and the display is already built they just have to br- whip it back out and maybe swap out different toys this time out in the display cases so you know certain things they can control and i think they can whet our appetites with ahead of time yeah i mean and like i said you know you don't have to tell us everything you're doing uh and and just give that little caveat on there you know uh events subject to change yeah you know that, that that's that's always a given for any event uh you know a guest may not be able to show up at the last minute um you know, uh, a prop may uh, may get damaged on the yeah. way to, uh, to the show. Uh, you know, things happen, yep. but at least don't be ambiguous about it. And and you'd think that they would have learned uh, learned that from uh, Botcon. You know, because that that was one of the biggest critiques about Botcon is people uh, they were a bit ambiguous about location mm-hmm. until sometimes. What was the? Uh, it seems like there was one. Months. It seems yeah. like there was one bot con that they didn't even announce it until like like a month or so before. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, don't be ambiguous about it. Let us know where it's going to be, uh, some of the things that it's going to entail, and let us decide early on if we want to uh, want to spend our money on this. Yeah. And then as you go on, 
uh, you know, drop a few more things later on. Uh, you know, like, okay, I think they announced Mark, Wal Mark Wahlberg was going to be there. Uh, you know, I'm wanting to say a week or two before the show they announced It's about this. Three, two and a half to three weeks. I yeah, uh, and that might have been uh, something that you would throw in there to say, draw in the people that were on the fence. It's like, mm -hmm. I really want to go, but there's just uh, not not a whole lot. And then if somebody really wanted to uh, meet Mark Wahlberg, uh, and, and you announce that, okay, that pushes them over the fence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, get get your people that that are tentative, tentative about it early on mm -hmm. and then throw in some bombshells later on. Um, and the people that just don't go after that, they're the ones that weren't going to spend the money to begin with. Sure, sure. Now, l going on with the theme of positive, we kind of meandered a bit there, but, yeah. you know, in terms of being positive, the other thing I want to say is uh, the the crew, the staff at this convention was outstanding. I mean, never, I mean, never have I been to a show where staff was so willing to help, you know, that every staff member I ever asked a question or asked for assistance, you know, you became their focus. Um, there was one exception to that, which we can discuss later, but, mm, you know, 9.5 out of 10 times. You ask somebody something, if they didn't know, they did their best to get you the answer as soon as possible. They'd find somebody uh, who did. Yeah. I mean, these these folks wanted to help. And uh, I, I give them a lot of kudos because I know some of them were volunteers. I know some of them, you know, were just kind of pulled in for the weekend, you know. And it's tough working weekends and you have your, you know, five-day-a-week job. And it's a chaotic event. It's the first time they've ever done it. But these folks, you know, you talk to them, you think they're going to be all frazzled and kind of, you know, grr, you know, like they are at Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. but, but no, these guys were just you know, total pros and they, they deserve nothing but credit for that. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of, I, I didn't really experience the whole Dungeons Dragons magic portion uh, of the convention. I'm not as familiar, but from what I saw and from a couple of the magic fans I talked to online, they were happy. Uh, so, so from that perspective, if anyone's wondering, it seems like it was worth, uh, going to. So, you know, before we dig into any criticisms or anything, you know, beyond what we've already talked about, I got to say, there was a lot they did right. They nailed a lot of things at this convention, and it gave me faith that if they just tweak certain other things, um, that this could be successful going forward. What, what was your single most, uh, single best experience at HasCon? Um, I think that, oh, I'm going to cheat here a little and give you two. Right. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> we, uh, the more, the better actually. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but they both required being a VIP. I will, I will state that up front. Okay. Um, one was, uh, talking to yoke -san in the, uh, yoke -san being one of the original grandfathers of Transformers. We would I not have, have Transformers without yoke -san, I have a period. reissue, uh, Perceptor autographed by him. Uh, and yeah, Paul Lighting, by the way. <laughs> um, I wish I could have found a, a, a Titan's Return Perceptor on shelf in time for him to have signed one. But uh, he, he uh, yoke san is just such a ray of sunshine And anytime he steps into a room. And I remember a few years ago at Toy Fair, you know, I've seen him at BotCon, I've seen him at Toy Fair, but I never expect him to remember me. And every single time he sees me, he remembers me. And I don't know how that happens. Uh, I mean, he's met so many people, hundreds of people at Vicon, and somehow he remembers me, you know, and I, I'm deeply honored by that. And so we're chatting in the VIP lounge where he was hanging out, and he asks me, like, you know, well, because we were talking about my collection. I said, how many pieces do you have? <laughs> and I said something like over 5,000. <gasps> why? <laughs> he just gave me this look like. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, Five thousand. Uh, yeah, and, and then I like went through the whole process of you know explain. He's like, well, how do you manage that? And I said, look, you know, I, yes, I have to catalog it, and um, I told him my whole process. It's like if I buy something, if it comes in, I'm not allowed to open it until I've cataloged it, and then you know once I've cataloged it, then I can open it. And then I scan the packaging and I re I explained all this to him, and he was. I don't know if he was horrified, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> a little bit of that. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I think I think he was just 
kind of amazed by the intensity of it and not just me i mean fandom overall like that this is how dedicated someone could be to this thing that he helped create well there's no uh, way he could have known decades ago whenever he <laughs> sat down at that uh, that drafting table and put that very that that pen to the paper mm-hmm. uh <laughs> for the very first line that was drawn to create sunstreaker yeah uh, the first yeah. first tri- uh, trans- uh, toy that actually became a transformer yep uh you know the he there's no way he could have known it would be what it is today and mm-hmm. I, i'm sure it is a, a, quite a shock you know <laughs> of sorts for him to sit down with someone and say yeah i have five thousand of these and i I, I meticulously catalog them, you know. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then uh, the other moment also involved Yoke san but this was bigger, is uh, he was doing a presentation at the VIP evening event. And uh, you, you heard about this, I'm sure. He brought the, the original G1 Galvatron gray model oh, and the no, uh, cloth model. And these were in glass cases. And, and then he showed us a slideshow, some old photos of him in, like, you know, the late 70s, early 80s at the Takara offices. And there was this moment where I was looking at these slides and I just got really emotional because how often do we get a window into the past like that of mm. this thing that so much? And it, it, it felt like, you know, it occurred to me, we may never see this presentation again. I mean, I he's retired. We don't know how many more times he's ever going to come to one of these things, right? Exactly. So it really... And this is one of those things that Hasbro nailed this presentation. That's one of those moments that felt genuinely special. And I actually felt very lucky at that moment to be part of that experience. Yeah. So those are the two highlights. You know, right. that's uh, that reminds me of, uh, it's not a convention experience, but uh, recently on Facebook, somebody shared, and I reshared it, uh, a video. It was a very short video clip uh, from uh, the 80s. And it showed Generation One Ramjet being yeah, produced. Yeah, yeah, I shared that too. And yeah. a lot, and a lot of people were making fun of it. You know, you know, making funny comments about it, or you know, uh, and everything. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm like, no, this, yeah, it, it is kind of funny at the same time. It, it is a glimpse into the past. The the mm-hmm. these are toys that are iconic. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing them being made mm-hmm. back whenever they were the hot thing, you know. I uh, mean, how how much would you give to be able to go back in time with a camera and just run around like Japan, the U.S., whatever, filming the phenomenon that was Transformers? Oh, I, I, I wish I had. I wish right? I had a couple thousand dollars to go back in the de- uh, back in time <laughs> and just um, buy everything. <laughs> Go into Toys R Us in 1985 or 84, mm-hmm. and just film those shelves in in like HD clarity, right? I mm-hmm. mean, I would love to do that. And and then of course, yes, go on a buying spree. <laughs> but yeah. you know, uh, th- you know that that video uh, you're, you're giving a great analogy there. It, 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 analogous experience is you you realize oh my god you know one someone captured this right yeah. that that amazed me i want to see but, more <laughs> yeah it's like i you know what if you just had an hour of like now hot rods being assembled now cuffs being assembled i'd watch it you know mm-hmm. um because it is a glimpse into this thing which had such an effect on our childhood and our adult lives i mean come on look you know i see the shelves behind you i've got shelves like that behind me right now mm-hmm. so you know the power of seeing something so historical and significant uh was very strong and uh those were the two huge highlights for me as a kind of old school fan well you know it's it's one thing uh, you know rick alvarez uh, told us uh before i believe it was on the show he's even told us that you know he's been to japan he's seen uh, seen them being made he's seen he knows the process of how it's done uh, and he said, it's, it, it's kind of like the magic is gone whenever you're doing, uh, doing that. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm like, I, I don't see how it could be, you know, uh, maybe I guess if you see it a lot and over and over and over and over and over again, uh, it, it could disappear some of that, but there would always be that I got to see these being made. Uh, uh, maybe it's just me. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know what? It, it's funny because 
the analogy I would think of, and this is personal, so maybe you feel differently, maybe other fans feel differently, and that's cool. Um, I am a huge fan of behind-the-scenes documentaries about movies. Oh, yeah. I love seeing movie magic. And I have watched dozens and dozens and dozens of documentaries over the years, whether it's, oh, here's a ship bottle we built, and we swooshed it on a stick, and you know, then we green screened it. And I've seen that so many times, and every single time I see a new one, my jaw still drops. I still sit there mesmerized. I'm one of those that likes like outtakes too. Of, uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, like Star Trek: The Next Generation. I have, uh, you know, I've, I've got every Star Trek episode on DVD. Uh, yeah. But uh, the Next Generation sets that came in the big silver package. Yep. yep. Uh, I have those, and just watching the outtakes that they had, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, goofing up lines. Uh, there was one, I believe. Uh, uh, Patrick Stewart was on the bridge dressed as Picard and doing like a soft shoe uh, uh, <laughs> thing. And it, and it was hilarious. Um, you know, I love those things. I, I'm right there with you. I'll tell you another example from my own personal experiences. Um, when I visited the set of the last night last year, uh, there was this point where we were in a, you know, we were on a set and we're watching Bay film, right? Mm-hmm. Hollywood. It, it's it, people don't think about it this way. It is work because these actors do the same thing like eight times, you know, in a row and there's camera setups and everything. So we were there basically watching one scene being filmed and over and over again, it was just the same thing, the camera resetting, you know, Bay yelling action and then the thing happening. And I think the first few times, like it was a group of us, you know, reporting on it. I think the first few times everyone was kind of mesmerized. Mm -hmm. I realized like at the end when he had done the last take, that I was the only one still kind of just staring and absolutely <laughs> in love with the process. Everybody and, was like getting bored with. Uh, well, people, right. <laughs> people needed to sit down, and I, yeah, I think folks were kind of like, "Okay, I've seen it." You know, I've seen him say that line five times, and for me, it's like, no, like, well, first of all, we don't know which take he's going to use. You know, I've seen the film; I'm still not sure which take he actually used. But, yeah. but you know, it, it it was like, no, but this is happening in front of us. Like, you know, all criticisms or quality judgments on the films aside we are watching a piece of transformers history being made in front of us Mm -hmm. so for me like going to a factory if i got if i saw you know yeah sure if i was there eight hours staring at you know perceptor being assembled for eight hours okay yeah that's gonna get boring i'm gonna need a snack and a a chair at some point Mm -hmm. but you know what the the significance of me being there and watching that i probably me i wouldn't lose that but i get how for other folks that could i think more. i would be right there with you <laughs> you know i'm one of those that 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 enjoys the process as much as the end product you know um you know it's it's kind of like my job you know i i do a very small part in in the production of uh, of ford pickups you know um you know i i haul a specific part to the manufacturing plant that's mm-hmm. my job uh but Every time I see a Ford pickup out on the on the road now, uh, that is the model that they make there. I'm I'm like you know it's very possible that I had a small part in making that to- uh, making that mm-hmm. truck, you know, and, and it's just a cool thing. I, I I kind of enjoy that, you know, but you know I, I you know I didn't put any of the screws in the in in the in the <laughs> truck. I didn't put the tires on, but I helped it come to be by bringing the part there. Yeah, sure. And, you know, and, and, and th- yeah, that's kind of dorky, but at the same time, that's me. I, I enjoy the process yeah. as much as I enjoy the end product. Um, mm-hmm. Now, getting back to Hascon, um, let's talk about uh, the the attendees. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of people were talking about beforehand um, that you know they're not sure how they would get along with like the Bronies or uh, you know GI Joe fans and Transformer fans. Uh, you know. You know, how, how are they meshing? How was the experience that you uh, observed from the, the 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 attendees' perspective? I mean, do you think, uh, were there a lot of adult collectors that seemed to be enjoying themselves? Were, you know, was there interaction? Absolutely. Um, and I will tell you that whether you're a Joe fan, a Marvel fan, Star Wars fan, whatever... <laughs> Uh, especially when you're online, that's when a lot of conversation happens. I think there's a common camaraderie, whether you 
understand the, each other's brand or not. Even the magic players, you know, those, those aren't even action figures, right? It's mm-hmm. cards. Um, there are certain principles that we all understand. We understand the wanting the hard to find thing. We understand the having to hunt for something. We understand meeting an artist or someone who had something to do with the creation of our thing being an exciting thing. Like we Mm -hmm. all get that. So I think because we can all relate to each other in that way, uh, there, there was no like, Oh, look at you fans muscling in on our territory. It was none of that. It was all very, very friendly, very super like, Hey, you know, we're doing this and you guys are doing that. And I hope you guys have fun and I hope you guys have fun. Um, in terms of uh, the the you know kind of mixing, I, I would say I don't think like armies of bronies wound up you know galloping into the Transformers area and vice versa. I don't think a lot of Transformers older fans galloped into the yeah. <laughs> you know pony area. But uh, what I think you did have, which is cool, th- this is the great equalizer. The kids, they didn't care. Mm-hmm. They, they're 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 not stuck to a brand. They're stuck to it's a fun thing. And if it's a fun thing, I'll go to it. And I think because the kids guided a lot of the adult interaction at the convention, mm-hmm. even if there was blending, it was always, you know, enjoyable or, you know, for the kids or for the fun. Uh, I did just my observation. I saw a few fans of like one thing who went into another section and they would kind of talk to the friend next to them and say, Oh, I, I think that's a magic thing. Or I think that's a transformers thing. I don't really understand, but that's it. And then they just keep going. You know, mm-hmm. there was never this like, Oh, well that sucks or anything like that. Um, I think also the one thing we all shared as Hasbro brand fans is we were all thinking, how is this going to go? You know, we all had the same kind of trepidation and same tension, almost like, am I going to have a good time here? And I, I'm mainly talking about, Friday here. Uh, but I think by Saturday, a lot of that had dissipated as well. Yeah. Now, and another thing that we, that we supposed, um, was attendance, overall attendance. <laughs> what would you, what would be your opinion of the actual attendance, uh, at um, Hascon? Was it, I, I, was there a lot of people or was it just, could it, could there have been more? There definitely could have been more, um, on Friday and maybe even part of Sunday. But I will tell you, on Saturday, there were moments where if you had to go to the bathroom, you needed to hop on a leg because, one, wow. you, you couldn't get to the bathroom. And it, two, once you got there, there was a line. Uh, and it makes sense. Think about it, right? So school's in session. So n- no kids are going to be there on Friday, right? Mm. And Sunday, you know, people are doing their shopping. They're going to church. They're getting ready for school the next day and work, right? So Saturday is the logical day, I think, for the convention to be like, crazy yeah. and it was um there were there was about a five hour span roughly around 11 to four ish where it was a mob scene and i mean that in the best way possible that's when i saw the kids having a great time and so on uh i don't know if you heard but for the nerf section they had set up an inflatable uh maze oh. and that and they armed you up and then you ran in the maze and just shot at people and whatever i, and, I would have liked to have done that <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> Dude, I kid you not, even on Sunday, I heard from others that the line for that was like over an hour oh, wow. wait to get into that. So there's no way I think you can claim they did not have good attendance, at least on Saturday and part of Sunday, because there were just certain things where if no one had gone, you know what? Everyone would have been going through the Nerf maze, you know, <laughs> after five minutes. So, right? so it's it's safe to say that they had a, with Saturday, they had a large walk-in probably. Yeah. Attendance. I think so. Mm-hmm. Also, also, I think, and I'm I'm totally guessing here. I'm guessing that Groupon must have had an influence too. Yeah, I'm guessing a lot of those folks they didn't just walk in and go, "What is this?" I'm guessing a lot of people saw the Groupon, bought it, and then said, "You know, I'm only going to go Saturday with my kids, and it's a nice way to spend the day." Now, another thing too, I, I want to get your take on it. Um, I've I've read uh, several. Uh, reports and opinions on it uh, i think brian kilby of uh, radio free cybertron he actually said this uh, too is that um i th- i think it was him i could be wrong um said that uh it felt more like a trade show than a convention what, what is your take on that uh that would be correct <laughs> uh in many ways and i say this in my report this felt like toy fair 
ballooned and became a convention. You know, um, this felt like a middle ground between Toy Fair and Comic Con. You know, mm-hmm. if, if the two of them decided to have a kid, this is the convention that would be born. Um, I'll tell you part of the reason I say that is because you mentioned this earlier. There was a dealer's room, but it was tiny. I mean, and there was only one dealer selling like G1 stuff or, or spare parts or anything like that. Wow. Uh, the rest of the dealers were more aimed towards cards, you know, like card sleeves and special, you know, collector things. A couple apps were there, uh, you know, app games, but it wasn't. Well, like, what was uh, that one dealer? If you, uh, if you, do you I know? actually don't. He didn't have a sign oh. that I could see, so I don't know. Um, he had a red shirt. I think that was kind of his brand. That's all I remember. But he sold a lot of stuff. He also had Star Wars. He had Star Trek, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, when, like you said earlier, when you go to BotCon, you, you, you want to go to the, Peru. you know, <laughs> you, know, you want to walk around and go, oh, my God, look at all this you know, classic stuff on top of going to big bads and going, Oh, I could just buy that instead of putting it in my, you know, private warehouse. Um, you want to be able to do that. I'd like to be able, I like being able to walk by, say art fire 2000s booth. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yeah. See Chuck's booth. You know, it's like, Oh my gosh. Oh, I wanted that. Oh, I want that. I want that too. I want that too. Uh, you know, Right? Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I it's did like, that missile. You yeah. know, it's like, do you have Death Source's guns? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and unfortunately, that was missing. And that forget Botcon for a second. To me, that is a critical component of a Comic Con, of a Creation Con, of a Heroes and Villains Con. They all need that component. And if you're missing that, then now it just feels like, okay, well, what's most of the display floor? Most of the display floor is set up by Hasbro for Hasbro for the kids. Right. So it's that's really kind of like how Toy Fair is. But that's for the retailers. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they did it right. (laughs) Yes. It felt more like a trade show than BotCon. But it was a hell of a trade show. I'll tell you that. Um, But yes, I I would say that's a fair evaluation. So what what are the things that would that would separate a convention from a trade show? Uh, Just for those who may be saying, well, what's the big difference? Uh, I think what I just mentioned, the whole talk about having a dealer's room, more fan-centric uh, tables, um, and I think part of it also has to be they're not necessarily displays set up by the company, right? It, it, it has to be a, uh, a big bad or, or, or a parts guy, you know, or art fire, right? Uh, it a, has third, to be, a third party yeah, uh, seller. Not a seller, yeah. It's, you know, um, and it, it, there also has to be a diversity in terms of the type of product, because when you walk the floor, except for some parts of it, um, almost everything you saw, especially in the kids area, this is either stuff that's on shelves now or it's stuff that's about to come out, right? Mm. Uh, when you walk around a creation convention or a, or, a, or a BotCon, you might see that Starship Enterprise from 1979 that you haven't seen since you were a kid, and you might have a chance to buy it if you make a lot of money. <laughs> for us Transformers fans, we, you know, you're missing that thesaurus gun. You have a shot at buying one. Mm-hmm. But this convention, that component wasn't there. And it does, it sounds like I'm making a big deal out of something relatively small, but that, there's a tether there to fans. Well, to me, that the dealer room is the biggest draw. Mm-hmm. For for me as a fan and collector, and I know that there's a lot of people uh, that are like myself, uh, in that you know, I you know the panels are one thing and vi- and meeting the guests uh, are one thing, uh, but let's be honest here, you can you can meet so many guests so many times, and it gets to be okay, that's really cool, I enjoy that guest, but mm-hmm. I don't feel the need I have to see them again. You know, and it's not, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. It's just that, you know, I'm primarily there for the toys. The guests are a secondary thing. And I think that's one thing that a lot of conventions, not just Hascon or even BotCon or uh, just a lot of conventions, they have focused so much on guests that Mm -hmm. they don't focus so much on what really brings people there, the toys. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I would say uh, the other thing that kind of separates it is uh, what made it a trade show is there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, 
how do I put this? And you're going to want to edit this part. But, uh, at, you know, at a BotCon dealer's room, yes, I see a lot of Transformers, right? But I might also see a Voltron, you know, from mm-hmm. the 80s. You know, I might also see some old Diaclone stuff, things like that. Um, and that was missing. And, and that there's a that's part to me. That's part of the fabric of a fan convention is that almost unpredictability of the what fringe you, stuff. Yeah, and and I I would love to see that. You know, I would love to see a table dedicated to someone's fan fiction. You know, um, stuff like that. That was missing as well. So that's what would kind of draw it closer. And and what I want everyone who's listening to understand is, I'm saying these things not saying well it sucked because it didn't have these things. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is. If this convention wanted to bring itself a little closer on that meter from, ex, you know, uh, industry exhibition show to fan convention, that these are some of the steps it would take. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let's let's kind of wind this up. And you said there were some marks that they missed. Well, uh, let's uh, just being real here. What marks did they miss? Well, I, as far and as- I mentioned some of these in my review, uh, but the the very first thing they need to do is lower the prices. Um, now that I've experienced it, I can honestly say that uh, for the regular price, let's forget VIP for a second, just regular admission, you're charging San Diego Comic-Con, New York Comic-Con-esque prices, but your convention isn't quite there yet. You know, you, you're, you're almost there, mm-hmm. but, you know, you're not there. So that Groupon price they offered, I think, is about right. I think that's about the price that they should have charged from the get-go. Um, and then the other thing which is related to pricing is uh, the fans need to be treated equally on the VIP packages so the biggest example I'll give you uh, is uh, all fans were given uh, gift bags uh, as part of their VIP package right Mm -hmm. Um, G.I. Joe fans one of the items they received was the Missile Command Center from San Diego Comic Con you know that was part of their set uh they also received some prints which were really nice and mm-hmm. I, I talked to a joe fan and he was he was gushing he oh, was really? so happy and i i was nice to see that um transformers fans we got a signed print by peter cohen and frank walker which is cool that's like to me like the coolest thing there uh, and a set of pins and a reprinted uh, a hardcover reprint of like uh, a couple marvel issues a couple idw issues that's it no toys? No toys at all. What? You would think you would think we would have gotten the RC or a power bank or even, you know, a mass release item, but you know, or a, a redeco generation. of a of a yeah. current toy that something honestly, I would have been happy with a deluxe, you know. I would have that to be honest, that would have really pissed me off. Well, I would have really been pissed I off. I actually thought they had left something out of my bag. I actually felt bad cuz I actually did go back and I said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, is this everything? And they, they did double check. They said, no, that's that's the bag. And I, this is before I knew about the G.I. Joe bag. So mm-hmm. I said, oh, I, okay, I guess, you know, I, I expected a toy, but I set up that expectation in my mind. No well, one ever told they me. They are that. a toy company. I mean, you, know, you think. But then, then when I sat down and I talked to, uh, I talked to a G.I. Joe guy, and I just told you what they got. I talked to a Marvel person. They got a signed Stan Lee photo um, and a 12-inch Hulk figure, and, I, and which, you know, okay, whatever. But, you know, I'm thinking, well, but that's, like, if you, com- if you line those three bags up and compare them, you know, we all paid the same amount of money. There might as well, there might as well have been a, a an arm with a middle finger extended coming out of the oh. uh, the transformer bag. I, I won't speak to that. But, <laughs> yeah. but what what I will say is my personal reaction was, wait a minute, I spent six hundred dollars just like the Joe guy, just like the Marvel guy, but why did he get more in his bag than I got in mine? So uh, from a we we were talking really about value from a value standpoint. It kind of felt like, as a Transformers fan, like, oh, well, I guess um, I'm less of a VIP than a Joe VIP. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, it, I would, I've felt that way. And, and I honestly think this is one of those things. Look, I work in corporate. I understand how these things work. I don't assume that the Pony team talked to the Transformers team, who talked to the Joe team, who talked to the Marvel team. I don't assume that. They probably all were told, make a gift bag, go. And they all made a gift bag. And they thought, this is a great gift bag. They'll love this. But what I don't think they expected was that people would 
kind of look at the other guys get back and go, wait a second. And I'm <laughs> hoping, again, going back to the earlier theme, that they take this as a learning going forward. Well, I mean, my, my biggest thing would be, even if it's something that is common and mass release, I wouldn't have cared if they had just thrown, well, I, I would have, but at the same time, I, it would have been something. If they had thrown a Titan Returns Bumblebee in the bag. Something. Yeah. I, I mean, it, you'd think a, a company that makes the toys uh, and throwing a convention about their toys would actually include a toy in their gift bag. <laughs> I was surprised, and I yeah. don't think I was the only one because I, I actually uh, one day I, I I was in the VIP lounge, so we're all VIPs, and I actually kind of sat down with a fellow Transformers VIP, two GI Joe VIPs, a Marvel VIP. Like I, I actually sat them down and I said, "I'm having this reaction because of my gift bag. I need you guys to explain to me your perspective." Because I said, I may just be being overly negative because of my experience, mm -hmm. because I expected a toy in here. What do you guys think? And the thing is, they all said to me, you know, the Marvel G.I. Joe, they said, we're happy. We love what we got. But the Transformers people were saying, we like what you got. <laughs> yeah. like, what, what about? So I want what, what you me? got. <laughs> um, and, and I think when you pay six to $800 for something, you, you have a certain more. expectation. You expect more. Uh, now, you, uh, I, I did read in the article you, there were some issues surrounding the exclusives, the Transformer exclusives. Well, and that's that. Yes, and that speaks to a a larger issue, which is policy consistency. Um, when the first day opened, VIPs were able to go in one hour earlier than everyone else. Uh, we we stood online and after like 45 minutes had passed and the line had barely moved, you know, start asking what's going on. Turns out they had only one register open uh, to sell exclusives. Uh, there were five other registers open for the Hasbro toy shop, but they weren't configured to check us out. So it's not that they didn't want to, it's they couldn't. Phys technologically, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. So to their credit, they fixed this, and within a half hour of that time frame, we were there was another register set up, and we were able to go over there and start checking out. And again, the employees were champs. They they were very nice. They handled us. Uh, that was one issue. But the second issue was that when we first went in, they they were telling us, okay, all the San Diego Comic Con exclusives limit two per person. All the Hascon exclusives limit four per person. And you know, all of us are thinking, hey, that's great. You yeah. know, no problem. Um, but. By the time the line started moving and they opened up those other registers, they said, no, now all it's all two per person. Now, first of all, most of, the, most of us guys who were still online at that point towards the front of the line, we were the VIPs. We, you know, we paid for the privilege of getting in a little earlier. Part of the expectation is that we can purchase a certain amount of goods. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you know, by that point like you know 50 60 people had already bought four rcs four power banks four magic card sets whatever so how is it fair to us we waited online too yeah and we paid our vip too and we were here at nine whatever this morning too so just by luck of the draw because he got online 15 minutes before i did he gets to have the four and we don't and that, that inconsistency is not exclusive to Hascon. All conventions yeah. have weirdness like that. But it it soured the opening a little for a lot of us. You know, I was talking to a lot of fans who were kind of like, are you kidding me? And I'm not just talking Transformers fans. I mean, everyone. Because there were people who heard the four, like myself, and were thinking, oh, great. You, you know, know that, help out a couple of buddies. It kind but, of reminds me of the, of the uh, BotCon 2016, uh, the Megatron uh thing uh you know they they kept saying that there's only this many available and uh they sold out you know I, I think like day one on them and then miraculously after the show was over there's so many available for this other show what <laughs> you know now, and to be fair with RC, they always advertised it as an early release exclusive. They made that very explicit when they mm -hmm. sent the original press release. So part of the reason I didn't, like, grumble too much about it was because I said, you know what? She's coming out later at some point. I don't know where. I don't know when. But we'll be able to get her. So, you just won't get the exclusive but, packaging. But Yeah. But, you know, if but from a policy standpoint, from a process standpoint, 
it it was not ideal to tell part of your audience one thing and then part of your audience something else you know perhaps a better strategy would have been okay you know you guys were all here before the doors opened you know to the mass public so here's the cutoff point i could kind of see letting the vips have that's what uh, I mean. you know like the, yeah the the four uh, you know limit four and then everybody else limit two well, it, that's the thing because we would make sense. literally paid to get in there earlier, uh, so that. But you know, that's an adjustment that I think they can work on next year. And I'm guessing next year is just going to be two of everything, none of this four business, mm-hmm. uh, and that's fine as long as you state it up front. Absolutely. Um, so, what would you say is the is the biggest thing that they need to work on outside of everything, or is it just you know, that's Very the funny cute. part. You know, from from my perspective, if I wanted to sit here, we could do an hour of me just nitpicking little yeah. things, right? But if you look at my review, like I tried to focus on the big organizational things, right? Mm-hmm. So price point, that's your biggest thing. Um, uh, and then second biggest thing is policies, you know stay consistent on that but also the the other thing i think they need to really focus on is believe it or not selling themselves better um and and i think they also if you want to make this a guest centric event as you said you know as a lot of conventions are um you need to start kind of pulling out all the stops a little more because unfortunately yes we had the last night coming out on home release so i'm sure isabella and mark uh, you know, came kind of as part of that and everything. Yeah. That's great. But they're not going to come next year. There's n- there's nothing to promote for them next year. Next year, maybe we'll get some of the Bumblebee movie people. But, you know, John how... John Cena! Could, how, I mean, that'd be great. But how consistently are you going to be able to pull that, right? Mm-hmm. So I think they need to expand their POV on who, what guests they can bring. You know, um, Tara Strong, for instance, would have been a perfect cross brand guest pony and transformers yeah yeah uh who has her own following right so i think that's another thing they need to work on so those those are three big things yes there are a lot of little nitpicky things but i actually think a lot of those will get smoothed out as they do kind of a a post-mortem and review the convention well i mean it's easy to nitpick everybody is going to find something that they don't like or didn't like and and nitpick it to death um i guess we can we can wrap this up i'm going to ask the big question did you enjoy yourself i did i did and i mentioned very early on in this cast that i i was on the train going up there feeling dread feeling like oh this is like a work trip and i will tell you by by saturday midday especially when i saw all those kids having fun i said you know what I, no, I am having a good time. I'm going to give them a lot of credit for what they've managed to achieve. Um, understand that me doing that also entailed me having to push aside a lot of my own issues with the convention, meaning the ticket reimbursement thing I mentioned earlier, meaning, you know, uh, kind of annoyance at minor things here and there. If I shoved all that aside, I was going to say, yep, you know what? I did have a good time. And it's funny you asked that because when I left on Sunday, I asked myself that on the train home. I said, did I enjoy that? I think I had a good time. I actually did. And I, I found myself a little surprised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but pleasant. So. Well, I mean, it's not without its its regrets. You can't say you didn't you, that you did it with no regrets, but you, you still enjoyed it yourself uh, nonetheless. Well, yeah. What I will say is I don't know if I'm going to do VIP again next year unless they really – blow my mind with something you know, they can't just say the transformers experience it has to be what what's happening here that's going to make it worth it and really they need to drop that price mm-hmm. now uh, i know our own uh, daniel uh he went as if i'm not mistaken he just went as a uh, a walk-in mm-hmm. uh and i have yet to be able to talk to him because he's been so busy with tf con and everything coming up um uh, i have yet to talk to him about his experience uh and um Possibly on a, on a on an upcoming episode of TFYP, I'll get a chance to ask him his thoughts as mm-hmm. a just a walk in a, a general attendee attendee, um, what he thought. Um, so your overall take on this right now, as it stands, 
would you recommend people go next year? Uh, if you have kids, yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> they are going to have the time of their lives. Like If you've got kids who love Pony or Disney Princesses or any of that, Play-Doh, go. Just, you know, I mean, don't do VIP, but <laughs> you know, just do a yeah. walk-in or, or do a Groupon or whatever. Um, but if you are fans such as us and you're waiting to see, well, what's the big VIP value experience? I can't wholeheartedly recommend it just yet as a VIP, but but if it's not too much cost for you to get there and stay there, uh, definitely at least one day as a walk-in, uh, as you had mentioned Daniel did, because I think just as a walk-in for one day, you would get a lot out of it as as a geek or as a sci-fi fan. I'm kind of hoping, and now I know that they have it in, in Providence because it's close to the headquarters, but it would be nice if they moved it around, uh, much in the vein of BotCon. I don't think they they will, but it would be nice. Uh, that way, people, excuse me, would have an uh, would have an experience, or or would have a chance to experience it as a walk in. Because you know, traveling a day or you know, flying in and just going as an uh, as a walk in, I don't know if that would have the appeal to me uh, mm -hmm. personally. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to San Diego Comic Con uh, for a day just as a walk-in. I'd like to have some of the perks. Um, mm -hmm. That's just me. Uh, but you know, if it were close and and I had the time and 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 sixty bucks, you know, sure. I, yeah. I, pr I probably would have tried it this year if I lived yep. close enough. Um, and I think that's the, uh, that that was as I said earlier. That was one of the big drawbacks for me is i would have to travel i'd have all these expenses yeah and i'd have to pay to get in and i and it just wasn't worth it you know if it was you know like pete's robot convention was, is like an hour drive for me mm -hmm. uh, and uh i didn't pre-register i just went as a walk-in mm -hmm. um because new convention i you know i wasn't sure if well I, for one i wasn't going to be able to be there friday night so pre-registering was kind of pointless for me uh, I'm I'm happy I went as a walk-in, um, and it was close enough to do that for me. Uh, yeah, and that's you know that's really where I'll agree with you because I'm I'm lucky that I'm on the East Coast. I'm you know I'm in the New York New Jersey area, so for me it was a four-hour trade ride mm -hmm. each way, and that's you know that's nothing. You fall asleep for a while and you're there. Mm -hmm. um, but if I was in California, I probably wouldn't. You know, I I have friends in California who've been to every BotCon since whenever and the 90s. And they just said, you know, they looked at airfare. They looked at the hotels and they said, I'm sinking so much money in before I even understand what I'm getting out of it. And they couldn't do it. And I totally get it. Just like my friend who couldn't spend five grand, you know, up front. And he's on the East Coast. Yeah. For him, it also would have been a four-hour train ride. So your, your point is very valid. I, I don't believe... If they do one next year, and I assume they are, that that would be anywhere else but Rhode Island. But I think if it is successful enough, I think if it keeps increasing in attendance and they make enough money off of it, perhaps in the future, you know, they'd be able to justify the expenditure because part of the expenditure is now you got to get a whole crew out there, you got to get mm -hmm. a whole staff out there to man this thing instead of you know right now it's in their backyard. Yeah, and if you notice the big years of BotCon, whenever the big displays was there, like they had the Transformer vehicles, they had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the stuff. It was near Hasbro warehouses, uh, yeah. or or the, you know, like or the, Paramount or Paramount. Yes, uh, so it was because of logistics. Logistics is yeah is a big part of the equation. Uh, well. Uh, ben, I want to thank you for being on here today. Uh, is there anything else about Hascon you want to tell the fans as they're listening? Uh, I would say uh, keep an open mind. Uh, I think this is something that we 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 as a collective fandom should want to be successful. Uh, just as when Fun Publications took over BotCon as a collective, I think it was best for us to want that to succeed. Um, and it did for quite some time, I think, um, on many levels. And now... This is what we have. You know, we're, we are not, Hasbro is not going to trash this convention and give us back BotCon exactly as we knew it before. Maybe it will reemerge at some point in the future. I don't know. But 
for what this is, I think they've done a very good job in many respects. I think there's always room for improvement. And I think if they improve those things that we've talked about this past hour and a half or so, I there's gonna it's gonna be a killer show mm-hmm. if, if they manage to iron out a lot of those wrinkles. So keep an open mind, everyone. I'm, that's, that's I'm pleasantly biggest. surprised by things that I've heard. I mean, uh, like you uh, like you said, there it's not without its its faults. Uh, but then again, neither was Botcon or any other show. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I, I, I am I am optimistic about the future for this show. Um, and if they if they are willing to learn from this experience um maybe it will be a great experience uh for for more people yeah to come yeah i I think there's definitely uh opportunity here there is potential here and that's an exciting thing for us as fans absolutely well benson thank you for joining us uh check out his website at bwtf.com uh ben's world of transformers great website Uh, uh always uh love to have you on ben uh, it's, uh, you're such a great part of this uh, fan community, and uh, I love reading your articles. It's just absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, if you love what we do on TFYLP, uh, please check us out on patreon.com slash TFYLP. Uh, help us keep the lights on. It helps, uh, helps us maintain our server fees, uh, upgrade equipment from time to time, uh, and just keep this podcast going. Uh, we love each and every one of our uh, Patreon supporters. Uh, without you, we couldn't be here right now. So thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, uh, to each and every one of you Patreon supporters. Um, so check out patreon.com slash TFYLP. Follow us on Twitter at TFYLP. And of course on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash TFYLP. You can join in, in all, all the discussion on there. Uh, Benson, once again, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time on TFYLP. Take care, everyone.